easy design tips for non-designers. So if there are any designers in the room, you might want to leave, or you might be bored, either way. So, you're not a designer, so why should you care, at least a little bit, about design? To answer that, let's take a big step back and think, why do you have a website anyway? Uh, presumably you have some goal for your site, like you want to sell more widgets or get donations or get leads or get visitors to your brick and mortar place or something like that, some sort of strategic goal. And usually people think that these goals are accomplished with strategy and SEO and content, and that's true, but I'd like to argue that design is actually also important, and even if it's kind of DIY, you should take it into consideration. So when people arrive at your site, they make a judgment about it in 50 milliseconds. <laughs> to think about how fast that is, when you blink involuntarily, that takes about twice as long. That's 100 milliseconds. So people are judging your credibility and whether they like you or your site really fast. If you've read Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, it's kind of all about this. Um, and this, this predisposition that is made on their first impression is so strong that it can even keep them from disliking your site later as they get more into it and there's things that they might not really like. They're, they'll fall back on their first impression and take that stuff more favorably. Or the reverse, if they didn't like your site on first impression, they're gonna kinda not like it as much in general, even if otherwise they would have. So, so you get the spinning wheel that makes you not able to change the slide. Um, Do we have a, a, a technical doctor in the house? Because so I have the spinning wheel of death that makes me not able to change the slide. Future reference force quit. Um, <laughs> so anyway, we're going to talk about some design hacks that will help you to tune up your site, even if you're not a designer. And the five areas in which we will delve, into which we will delve, are hierarchy, consistency, color, images, and type. Um, I'm not going to talk about any of the really granular logistics of implementing any of this stuff because we're all doing our own thing with WordPress. You might be on .com or have your own install or have a page builder or not have a page builder or have a different theme or a different plugin and you might know CSS or not and we're all different and that's cool because with WordPress you can do just about anything if you try hard enough and you know Google enough. So. Oh, and if you do want to find out how to implement something, um, I'm going to be hanging out at the happiness bar a lot tomorrow probably, so you can come bug me about it and I will try to answer. So, hierarchy. Um, this is one of my favorite words. 
or actually hierarchical is even better, even though it's kind of hard to say, because it really does the design for you once you start thinking hierarchic hierarchically. Um, and what I mean by that is that on every page of your site, the most important thing should be the most obvious. The second most important thing should be the second most obvious. The third most important thing, and so on. And it really dictates your design decisions for you. Um, so on a page like your home page, you just want to make the most important thing the most obvious visually. Um, you might even choose to stop at two, two important things for a page to make them that much more blindingly obvious. For example, this page really just has point, um, just has the most important message and the call to action button. And they're blindingly obvious because that's really all there is. Here's some more tactics for making things stand out on your site. Put the most important thing at the top of the page or near it. Make it the biggest thing on the page. Use a color that stands out. Use a font that stands out. Leave space around it. People look at pages in an F-shaped pattern, so put things where people are going to be looking. Use a striking image or a pattern to make your most important message more obvious. Here's a page that might look okay, but it's actually kind of bad. Here's why. When I get here, do I look at message one? Do I look at message two? Do I look at message three? I don't know. They're all pink and the same size and the same weight and the same font. They could, each one of these could be the most important thing. Do I click on this orange button, or this orange button, or this blue button, or this blue button? I don't know. Should I look at this picture? I don't know. The logo's kind of big. Don't make your users think too hard by confusing them with design that doesn't point them in the right direction. Sometimes, though, your site might be a little more complicated. Maybe you don't have that one burning message that you need to convey. Maybe there's a bunch of information. Um, the example that I come across often is in museums, they often want to show you all the things that are on special exhibit at that time because uh, uh, different people are going to have different things that attract them to the museum. So you still make that blindingly obvious, you just might have a few options for what's blindingly obvious. And I know sliders are controversial and there's a lot of reasons not to use them, but in some cases it's a way to make your, your most important message be the only thing on the screen at the time, and then the next thing is the most important thing on the screen at the time. Um, and then when you get inside your site, WordPress kind of helps you, because built into it, there's a hierarchy of headings. If you um, are familiar with the Tiny Mice Editor, you'll know that there's heading one, heading two, heading three, etc. built in. And you can even see in the menu that WordPress gives you that they're hierarchical. Here's my thingy. Like biggest, second biggest, third biggest, etc. And that reminds you that they should be used that way on your site and they should be styled that way when you are either choosing options or using CSS. In my example here, my um, heading one or H1 for CSS speakers is big and pink and it's in all caps. So it's visually the most important thing in the hierarchy. My heading two is, <laughs> is also pink. It's actually the same font, although it's an upper and lower case, and it's a little smaller, so <coughs> it visually subsides a bit compared to heading one. Um, my heading three is also, it's also pink. It's actually the same size as heading two, um, but I have taken it down a notch to the font I use for the textile. So my point here is that 
I'm just changing a few elements each time to make that visual hierarchy, not using like every tool in the book. So it's not crazy and cluttered and flashy, it's just a sort of quiet progression that helps my visitors understand what's the most important. Next topic, consistency. So consistency is something we understand in general and we employ strategically in our businesses and our websites. We know that you know, we have to be consistent about our marketing message and we have to be consistent about writing our blog and how our brand presents itself and that stuff. But on a micro level, um, there's a lot to be said for consistency in our visual design. And it's really going to help people to find stuff on your site, to understand your site, and again, to not to have to think about it too much, to just let them know what to do on a more subconscious level. So here are a bunch of things to be consistent about. Um, buttons. All your buttons that do the same or like things should look the same. They should be the same background color, same font, same type size, have the same hover effect. There's no reason to go crazy and make every button different. That's just going to confuse people and make everything visually cluttered. On the other hand, if you do have a button that does something different or that needs to stand out because it could cause your users a, users a problem, do make that somewhat different, like the delete all button here. And again, um, I didn't change everything about it, I just changed the background color. So it feels like it belongs on the site, but it does stand out because it's scary bright pink. Um, colors. In your site, keep colors consistent throughout. So here on this imaginary site, every page title is blue, every link is orange, every um, pink square thing in the widgets area is pink. And um, so my users don't have to think. Orange click, it's a look. It also makes it a lot easier to build a site when you're not trying to add variety for the sake of adding variety. Uh, another thing to be consistent about is spacing. Um, in this example, the space is consistent between the text and the images, between the heading and the text, between the button and the next element. And again, it's something that's not going to be noticed consciously unless it's screwed up, unless it's not consistent. Um, if you know my choice to text was off to the side, people would wonder what it meant. So just keep it consistent and wind up. So alignment's another thing to be consistent about. Um, here's all the things that align on the site. You wouldn't really think about it, but you know, the bottoms of the buttons align with the bottoms of the pictures, and everything's contained within the box created by the um, header, nav, and logo. And there's cons you know, consistent spacing between the picture and the text, and that all kind of lines up in this nice grid. It's not a, it's not a technically a grid in terms of like, you know, exact math or using a, a CSS grid. It just visually lines up. Do it however you have to do it. <laughs> All right, next topic, color. So the first thing I want to say is that color theory is really awesome and cool and you can read all about it, but you totally don't need to know it to be able to choose cool colors for your site that are going to work. Um, so here are some hacks to choose colors in other ways. First one, the first hack is keep it simple. Um, on this imaginary site, I have four colors, but you could design a successful site with two colors, no problem. Um, three colors, four colors, five colors, don't go more than that. It will just make your life complicated and your palette visually cluttered. Um, here, I'm just using pink, blue, and orange, and gray. And gray's barely a color. I mean, I like gray a lot, but it almost doesn't count. Um, 
color hack number two. Remember to choose colors that support your message and your audience and your brand. So, for example, young, fresh, and innovative looks different than established, conservative, and dependable looks different than fun, playful, and all about the kids. These things are really kind of visceral and subjective, and there isn't a right answer, but there are probably wrong answers. Um, if I made my, my, my third site there for kids, if I made it all, um, you know, black and gray, it would probably feel wrong, unless it was for like goth birthday parties for kids or something. Um, in which case that would be a great color palette. Um, so don't use colors that feel wrong. You'll know, even if you, people tell me all the time, I'm so bad with color, but you'll know. I mean, there are so many cultural touchstones in the world where there's things have colors and they tend to repeat um, the kinds of palettes that for different kinds of things. If you're really in doubt, you know, look at look at ten different financial websites. They're going to be in that dark blue gray kind of palette. Or look at ten kids websites. They're going to be in super bright colors. Whether it's like this kind of pink blue purple thing or something else. There they there are these cultural things, and they change over time. I mean, if you want to get philosophical about it, like in the nineteenth century. Um, Pink was for girls and blue was for boys, you know, culture shifts. But, you know, work with where we are now and you'll be fine. Uh, color hack number three. Just choose some neutrals and a pop of color. Like, these are all shades of black, i.e. gray, um, and a few bright colors. Some of these palettes have one bright color, some have two. But it makes it really simple and it gives you some variety to work with. Hack number four, find a photo you like and use a site like labs.tineye.com to suck the palette out. Oh, and by the way, um, I have a handout with all the URLs plus lots more, and that's going to be on the last slide, so don't worry about writing them down. Um, so, okay, so here's a photo I like of some capybaras in a um, spa with some berries, and this is what I got when I put it on that site. Um, it tells me the colors that it sucked from the photos along with their hex code, so I can plug them right into my site however I choose to do so. Um, and this is, if you're feeling uninspired, it's a great way to uh, appropriate a palette. Color hack number five, similar but different. On this site called paletter.com, you can put in a word and it will find images and give you palettes from those images. So here I did Washington DC, but you could put in a season or an animal or a place or an emotion. You'll get all kinds of results. And you know, maybe it's not the perfect palette, but it will give you some ideas. And it's they're they're kind of weird. Like that I would never think of that palette on the top with purple and dark green and stuff. I, I don't know, it's interesting. It's a jumping off place. Um, here's another one. Um, here's another one. <laughs> uh, this site, colorlisa.com, has palettes derived from famous artworks. So we got some uh, dancing in Baden-Baden with Max Beckmann at the top and a Joseph Albers at the bottom. And Joseph Albers is the uh, father of color theory, if you uh, I want to read something really technical. Um, but he did do this really cool palette that I like a lot. It's pink and orange. So there's all kinds of stuff on there. And imagine, like, you know, the Da Vinci is really different than these. It's all earthy colors or, or you know, Pollock or whatever. It's all, it just sends you in all kinds of directions. Um, another color hack. There are curated palettes and crowdsourced palettes all over the web. Um, colorhunt.co has palettes that people submit, that's all the stripey, all the little stripies. <coughs> um, there's all kinds of cool ideas on there, and designseeds.com has colors that are carefully curated palettes from photographs, and those, they have some really interesting subtle things on there. Color hack number eight. Um, 
there's also some tools that almost in a game-like way let you choose palettes. Um, these are coolers.co and something called um, color.hailpixel.com. And both one of these, you press the space bar and the colors keep changing and you can kind of like stop when you like something. On the other one, you drag your mouse around and it dynamically changes um, one bar at a time. And when you like it, you stop and then you move on to the next bar. And it gives you the hex colors and all the, you know, the different things you might need. And it's a, it's a very... Um, sort of tactile way of playing with color that it's not technical, it's just you're just using your your frou-frou color emotions to uh, choose things. Uh, another similar but different thing is there are sites like Palaton.com and also um, Adobe's free online version of their color tools that let you choose colors in really actually quite technical ways. These have all kinds of color theory things where you can choose uh, analogous and complementary colors and like move around the color wheel and adjust the hue and the saturation. But again, whether you are doing it because you understand those terms or because you just want to play with it, which is kind of what I do, um, it's really helpful to help you come up with a palette. Um, and color hack number nine on a different bend is don't blow off people who can't see color well. Um, you can use a lot of color on your site, but 8% of men and 0.5% of women, we think, have some form of color blindness. So make sure that color isn't the only indicator of something that's important. Uh, also, make sure to use enough contrast in general so that um, even people with low vision can see whatever the color. All right, next one. Next big topic, images. So in a perfect world, we would all be able to commission photography for our websites, and it would be really custom and amazing and awesome. But usually we're stuck with stock and that's okay i have some hacks for making life better um my first one is just hire this guy <laughs> but that's not a real one unfortunately um my second one <laughs> is uh don't use hackneyed cliched images please never ever put a picture of a handshake on your site ever again it would be so cool. Um, these kind of images that you've seen everywhere that are, you know, these cliched conceptual things like, oh, oh, we all love each other. Just, it, it doesn't add, it, it detracts, it makes people trust you less. So I'd rather see no images than bad images. And back to the positive. Um, Try finding images that are framed interestingly to attract people's attention and, and like break that, oh, I've seen it before mold, you know, mother and child. How about mother and child on a sofa shot from above? How about a street scene shot from a weird angle? Um, it's kind of like an, in, I, I think of it as an indicator of good photography when it's not exactly what you'd expect. Uh, so look for interesting framing and composition. Another one is to look for interesting um, depth of field, or it's basically what's in focus. I really think this is a good indicator of when a photographer knows what they're doing, when they choose to focus on something and leave the rest blurry, whether that thing's in the foreground or the background. It just shows that they actually know how to use a camera. And um, so even if one of those images isn't what you need, look at their other stuff. They're probably skilled. Um, and it also, it helps people to focus on what you want them to focus on. So uh, consider depth of field as a factor. Uh, next image hack. Don't be afraid of black and white. You know, we're all like terribly modern on our websites, but black and white can actually be a good shock to the system and it can be more sophisticated or more artsy more elegant, 
or just generally unexpected. So don't stray away from black and white photos. Um, you might even want to say like all my uh, uh, post thumbnails are black and white and that would create a very striking blog that looks a little different than every other one. Not appropriate in all circumstances, like it might be kind of a drag for a food blog or something, but it's a nice option for some things. Uh, next image hack. Uh, there are actually good stock photo places now and they're free. So. This is a thing that people are doing um, motivated by a desire for better photography in the world or to get people to their site because they're giving away cool free photos or you know, a belief in open sourcing or, or whatever their motivation, but there's actually a lot of them now. So um, unsplash.com is really quite famous and you might actually have recognized some of those photos from seeing them so much, but there's um, another one I used here for this boat photo is jmantry.com and I have a whole big list in my handout thing of places with cool stock photos that are actually free and some you have to credit but most of you don't even have to credit. Uh, next tech, use Creative Commons search. It's totally awesome. Um, so you get to this uh, search.creativecommons.org. It's a search engine that searches multiple sites that have not just photography, but also vector type icon stuff, music, video, you can choose where you're going. I actually used it to find some music the other day that was um, free to use, which was really cool. Uh, this will also search Flickr for you only on things that are licensed for commercial reuse and our licensed Creative Commons. So while you can just go to Flickr and do that search yourself, you can also do it from the search engine, which is a handy place to start. Um, and I don't know, as, as WordPress people, I really also like participating in the Creative Commons more free distribution of art type community. So uh, I'm, I'm using this thing all the time. All right, next one. Oh yeah, and don't forget to give credit when you're supposed to, because that's what it's all about. Next topic, type. So I'm kind of a type geek, and um, I have a book sitting in my to-read pile that's like this thick, and it's all about the font Palatino, and I'm really excited about it. <laughs> and it was signed by the author, it was so cool. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go there. Um, here are some simple -er, um, ways to think about type that are actually more what I do day to day that I think everyone can do. So um, when you're choosing typefaces for your website, again, keep it really simple. You could choose two typefaces. In fact, I think you should. And that's it. Don't, um, don't get too complicated. It's going to make your site look cluttered and like confuse people like why does this font look different than this font? Just keep it super simple with two fonts. Um, sometimes I go crazy and choose two fonts and then a third font for interface elements like buttons and stuff. I'll put in a different font but that's just me going crazy. Um, and you, this has to do with the next slide. I'll just go to it. Um, when in doubt, choose one serif and one sans serif typeface. Um, and you don't have to, there's no rule that like the serif is for text and the sans serif is for the headlines. On the web, sometimes some look better as one or the other and you should see how it looks. It's not, there's no rule. Um, type hack number three, and this one's kind of like color. Make sure your typefaces go with the brand you're trying to convey and the feeling and the audience. Um, and again, this is more about the wrong answers, not about the right answers. There's tons of right answers. Um, you know, there's young, fresh, innovative fonts, and there's fun, playful, all about the kids fonts, and there's tons of different combinations I could have chosen for these. But there's some that would have been kind of 
not right and you'll know that viscerally I mean you're a part of the culture like even if you don't care about typography at all which is fine um, you'll know like in your in your heart like this doesn't feel like it's for kids um, and more to that point don't use novelty fonts and cheesy handwriting fonts unless you have a really legit reason to do so that's all I'm gonna say. Um, type pack number five. There are some really cool, talented designers who, uh, just because they think it's fun, have made sites where they show you fonts that go together. And um, this one, well, I'm not gonna read you the URLs because they're long, but there's two at least in the handout I have that. They're beautiful, they're beautiful pairings, and they're all Google fonts that you can get for free and that are easy to put on your site. And they show you what they look like together, and you'll look at it and you'll get the feeling for what that's like and be able to choose from many, many combinations. And even on this site, they um, you can even click to just download the fonts or to copy the code to put it on your site, just one click, which is very cool. Um, next hack. Don't be limited by the fonts that your theme comes with. If you're using a theme, uh, you can use plugins to install Google fonts really easily on your site. This is just four of them. Just look in the plugin directory for Google fonts. And if you're not familiar with Google fonts, there's, I don't know, several thousand that are free to use and um, there's so much to choose from. Sure, there's you know, a million paid fonts out there too, and those are really great, but free fonts are pretty good too. Um, so yeah, check out the plugins to install those on your site. Hack number seven, use one of these combinations. They pretty much work in any circumstance. These are all Google fonts. Uh, hack number eight, don't make your type too small. People get really sad when they can't read stuff because it's too small. Um, so here, this is I think 18, the equivalent of 18 pixels, and I, I tend to go 16 pixels or higher on my body copy on websites. Seems really big if you think about the state of web design 10 years ago, but oh, it's so much better. You can read things. Uh, or that would be, it's usually 1M if you're working in M's, if you're set to the default 16 pixel M. Um, and, and also, err on the side of more spacing between your lines of type, or it's called line height in CSS, um, or letting in the print world. And it really helps people to be able to read if you have a little bit of air in between your lines of type. Not too much, because then you lose your place, but um, generally a little more than the default that your tools will give you. Um, for example, this is a 16 pixel type with 24 pixels of line height. So that kind of ratio. Uh, next type hack, don't underline stuff on the web unless it's a link, because people will think it's a link. So titles, italicize them. Or if it's an article title, put it in quotes, or whatever the you know, MLA tells you to do. But don't underline stuff on the web. Uh, hack number 11. Uh, WordPress makes it really easy to use the right typographic characters for like punctuation, and you should do that. There's this little uh, omega symbol in your tiny mice editor, and it opens up that palette below with all the different funny dots and dashes and things. Use those. Um, it makes your site more readable because it's you don't jar people with the wrong thing. It also some people like designers judge you if you don't use the right punctuation, um, but. <laughs> So for example, use an M dash, the longest one, um, when you're setting off phrases. Use an N dash for setting off ranges of numbers or dates. Use a hyphen when you're hyphenating or in a compound word. Um, 
use a real ellipsis instead of three dots. There's actually a character that has them spaced straight. They're not all smushed out or spread out. And this one, oh, I feel like I'm being so scoldy, I'm sorry. But uh, this one is for us older people. It's one space after a period. Just one. <laughs> um, I know your sixth grade typing teacher would, would disagree, but actually in digital typefaces, they build in the right amount of space after each character, including the period. So it's all, it's all set for you. Um, and yeah, I'd be so happy if, if two spaces after a period just went away. And um, thank you for obliging me. And thank you for obliging me. There are find and replace plugins <laughs> that will find two spaces. I do this on my client side okay. all the time. So the uh, slides with notes and a huge list of resources with URLs are available at Durable Creative dot com slash WC17, like WordCamp17. Um, and also, do you have any questions? So, when does one space as a period? One, one space after a period is correct. And I do two spaces, and I don't see anything unusual on my blogs. <laughs> There's been a lot of articles about that. They can tell you how old if you still use an AOL address to put two spaces. <laughs> It's just. And it's, I still have AOL, so. It's yeah. I, have AOL too. <laughs> I mean, I, I totally I empathize. I actually learned typing on a manual typewriter, and I, that's what I was taught as well. Um, but. I didn't learn on a manual typewriter. But in fonts, it's it's the right amount of space is built in, and if you're putting two spaces, you're using double the right amount of space. Same for um, like colons, one space afterwards, all of them. In, in English, I mean, there's different rules for, say, French and stuff that you space them differently, but just for English, one space. Anyone else? Yeah? Are there two font rules applied to the title of your website? Like, you the type, like the header thing? Um, well, like, you know, there's like your header, right? Like your headlines for your articles, but then there's also like the title of your website font. Is that included in that you should only have two fonts? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna. Um, yeah. I'll repeat the question. Uh, is the two font rule? Does that include the title of your website, like that's up in the header? So I would consider the title in the header more like a logo, and I would not necessarily confine it to one of the two fonts that are used on the site. I mean, you could if it's if it feels like the right font for your title. But um, yeah, I would consider that more like a graphic element and just use what. It needs to be. Way back. Can you talk a little bit about browser compatibility and how far back you think it's necessary to go to be compatible and you know, using something really updated that maybe isn't supported by it? Okay, so the question's about browser compatibility and how far back you need to go. So, in a way, that's not really a design question, um, but I will answer it anyway. Um, in, I mean, in general, when you're designing, there's a concept of um, graceful degradation where you might have fancy features like animations or hover effects or any kind of like new CSS that only work on the newest browsers. And you should make sure that even if they don't work on older browsers, it still makes sense. Like people can still understand what's going on even with that de without that design element. Um, so for example, you know, you have, well, like older um, internet explorers didn't support rounded corners. So maybe, you know, in your perfect world, website, your buttons have round corners, but on the IE they have square corners and you're just like, okay, those people are going to have to deal with that. Um, that's graceful degradation. Um, but in general, I would make sure you understand who your audience is um, through uh, metrics like analytics uh, and what kind of technology adoption they have and 
target those browsers. Um, I have clients who are corporate and can't get their stuff upgraded and are on Windows 7 and God knows what. And um, I have clients who are cutting edge technology and their audiences tend to be just on their phone. So it's it's kind of, I know that's, that's kind of an it depends answer, but as much as info you can get from metrics in your audience, um, use that to guide your decision. Ah, uh, it's this address on the screen, if you can't read it. Um, it's durablecreative.com slash WC17. And it has the slides with notes and the list of URLs and stuff.